My message today is just say yes. And I've been thinking for several weeks about the man Moses, his story, his journey. And in the first four chapters of Exodus, we won't turn to it, but I really want to encourage you to look at the beginnings of not only for Moses, but also the intent of God for Moses' life and also for Israel as a nation. Moses' name means drawn out. And his mother put him in an ark because of the fear of what Pharaoh had said that the male children needed to be destroyed when they were born. She, because of her fear for the, of the Lord, I believe, and her prayers for her son, was led by God to put her son in a ark, uh, a basket, we will call it an ark, on the water. And it was covered with pitch, and she covered it, and she, as she prayed, put her son out on the, the water with Miriam, Moses' sister, watching. And with her putting him on the ark was a prayer. Knowing that Pharaoh had said that the children would be killed, God said no. God said no. And that's why we need to cherish every human life and continue to stand against the spirit of infanticide that would even destroy this nation. It's called abortion. God says no. And we need to say no. And when Pharaoh was, when the Pharaoh's daughter found Moses in the Nile and took him into the household of Pharaoh, the Bible says in Acts 7.22, you can write it down, I'll read it to you, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. God allowed Moses to be in the household of Pharaoh even for an education because it's the reason why you have the five, first five books of the Bible that were written by Moses. But that wasn't the only reason. It allowed Moses to see what was the spirit that was in Pharaoh's house and the spirit that was controlling Egypt all the gods. He saw them. He was raised in that household. And when God put it in his heart to go out and look upon his brethren, and you know the story about how the children of Israel, the taskmasters over them, that they had to make the bricks with the straw and the clay and all those different things, that it was heavy, harsh burden for hundreds of years over the children of Israel. Harsh burden. And he went out to look on his brethren because something was in his heart. And what was in his heart was, these are not my people. Those are my people. The slaves. And so with everything that he had in Pharaoh's household, when he rose up, when an Egyptian was mistreating one of his countrymen, and he rose up and killed him and put his body in the sand, and when Pharaoh heard about it, and was going to kill him, God said no. God said no. And when he went to the land of Midian, being led by God, that those first 40 years of being in Midian, finding his wife, serving under his, literally leading him to a family of Jethro and Jethro's daughters, and he married one of them, Zipporah, and that became the family he was connected to. And later on in God's economy, Jethro gave Moses wisdom. You think God was in that? God said yes. Which brings me to the point that I want to talk to you today about the burning bush. Moses being faithful to take care of Jethro's flock because that was his training ground for taking care of another flock of over a million people. Be faithful, brothers and sisters, in small things, because the small things that you would be faithful in with a right attitude and a right heart will lead you into promotion. Yes, yes. Did you hear that? Yes. 
So don't complain about your boss and your job and just where you're at. Be faithful. God has promotion in mind for you. And so a dialogue starts in chapter 3. Chapter 2, chapter 3, you begin to look at a dialogue. We get into chapter 4 of God having a dialogue with Moses. And Moses goes up to see this site at the mountain of God, Mount Oreb. He goes up there to see, and you all know the story of the burning bush. And there's something about reading that scripture where it talked about how God appeared to Moses in that burning bush. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him. It's capital A, angel, capital A which means it was God. And then we know it's God because God told Moses that he came to see this, this bush that was burning but yet wasn't consumed because it was burning with the presence of God. How many people in this room want to burn with the presence of God? I saw some burning bushes walking around this church this morning. I saw people on fire. You're on fire. But I saw some people that were interceding and worshiping. I saw some burning bushes bushes burning with the fire of God. Yes. That's what God wants. Yes. I knew I was in the right church today when you, the first two songs you sang were the songs that we sang in Elsinore this morning. <laughs> we must be listening to the same Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you something. Get this point out to you. God was calling Moses to be a deliverer. And this dialogue that went on in these chapters of 2, 3, and 4, this dialogue that God patiently had with this man who was mighty as words and deeds in the place called Egypt, now before God, you and I are reduced to nothing because only God can do it. But I want to tell you something. Do you know who was speaking out of that burning bush, capital A, angel of the Lord, and said, take off your shoes for the place that you're standing is holy ground? Jesus. Jesus, in a pre-incarnation appearance, was telling Moses, and you've got to get this, I, the deliverer, am going to deliver you, and I'm going to use you to deliver over a million people. So God was speaking out of Christ even at that moment and speaking to us. So this dialogue was going on. The dialogue went on and God was telling Moses, I am the God of your father. First of all, he said, I'm the God of your father and your mother who even put you in that ark. And then he begins to mention, he said, I am also the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, I've seen the oppression that's gone on by the Egyptians over my people. And he says, I'm going to deliver them, and I'm going to use you to do it. And Moses is just blown away. God, you would use me, me who ran from Egypt because I killed a man, and they all knew about it. I who am from the tribe of Israel, from the tribe of Levi, you would use me to deliver your people. And so Moses begins to tell God, no, it can't happen. And God patiently tells him, when you go tell my people, and Moses said, who am I, who am I to tell them who sent me? Tell them the I am. Hallelujah. Amen. The I am has sent you. My brothers and sisters, the I am is still here. The I am is living inside of you. The I am of Jesus in the book of John, when he began to talk about the seven I am to who I am. Listen, he is that one that is still the I am. And he is the one that's living inside of you. Amen? Amen. He began to show Moses signs. Why? To build his faith. 
he begins to show Moses' sign to build his faith. Throw down your staff. He throw down his staff. It becomes the snake. Pick it up again. That was a faith builder. Besides that burning bush that was speaking to him. How many of you know it would be kind of hard to take this all in even though you're doubting? Build his faith. Put your hand in your side. Pull it out. Leprous hand, white. Put it back in. He brings it out. It's just as normal as the other one. It was a sign. Moses tries to disqualify himself. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Have you ever been there when God burdening you to do something and you want to disqualify yourself because of the past? I want to tell you your past has been buried Amen. in Jesus. Yeah. And we need to realize God has buried our past and we need to forgive ourselves and we need to realize that we are not the same people we were. There is no shame. There's no, if you've heard me say it before, there is no future in your past. Amen. Only wisdom not to go back there. Right. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So Moses is having this conversation with God, trying to disqualify him, himself. And then he comes to verse 11 and 12 of chapter 4, and he said, I don't speak well. Send somebody else. How many times we have come to the place where we've said, God, you know, that's a great vision. That's a great word. God, why don't you send somebody else to do it? In one way or another, we've done that. And God tells him, and you need to hear this, who has made man's mouth? Who has made man's mouth? Who has made man's mouth? Who has made the blind? Who has made uh, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have I not the Lord? I've made them all. Whatever things that you would use to disqualify yourself from being a vessel that God would use, stop it. Quit disqualifying yourself for God using you. I don't think you're hearing me. Stop disqualifying yourself. Moses, think about it. I spared your life. I wouldn't let them kill you. I led you this far. You think I'm speaking to you out of this burning bush just to hear myself talk? Moses, I'm serious. I want you to be serious. Church, God wants us to be serious with the vision we have this year. Yes. Be serious. The time is late. The hour is late. The darkness is continuing to rise over the land. But the people that know their God shall do exploits in the book of Daniel. Yes. But the people that know their God, yes. uncovering the unseen, not only in warfare, but what Dave, Pastor Dave read earlier in the book of Revelation, the unveiling of the Christ, the unveiling of Jesus to you this year, who he is, we haven't even scratched the surface. For eternity, we will continue to find out about the wonderfulness and the majesty and the grandeur of our God. And like Abraham, when he was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, when he began to go from 50 down to 10, and Abraham at one point said, God, who am I but dust, that I would speak to you and intercede for a city. Did you hear that? Yes. Moses, who has made man's mouth? Who has made man's mouth? Moses, I'm, I want to send my people to a land of milk and honey. Moses, Moses, listen to this. I'm going to tell you what to say. 
I'm going to tell you what you should do. That stick you have in your hand is a symbol of my authority. I'm going to have, have you touch it, and it's actually going to cause the Nile to turn to blood. Moses, this is what Pharaoh's going to do. Church, when I read this, this brings comfort to me, but God, how God was so patient. Amen. God was so patient. I want to tell you, we have a God that's patient with these people. He loves you so much, he's patient. He's long-suffering. He understands, the Bible says, that our frame. He knows how we're made. He knows how you are individually made. He knows you're bent. He knew Moses, who was mighty in words and deeds and all those things in Egypt. But when he came into the presence of God and God told him to do this, church, listen, God sees more in you than you see in yourself. God sees more in you. God's already been in your yesterdays. God's already been there six months, six years, 60 years from now. He's already been there. And it's for greatness, and it's for glory, and it's for his praise and for his honor. And it is with blessings. Moses, who has made man's mouth? Moses, I'm going to use you to change a nation. I'm going to use you to speak to demon spirits that were over the land of Egypt, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is greater than all those gods that are in the land. Yes. My brothers and sisters, we stand with the rod of God in our hand. Yes. His name is Jesus. Yes. He is King of kings, he is Lord of lords, and he has given you authority, and it's time we start believing it. Yes. It's time that we start believing it. That in my name, you will speak with new tongues. In my name, you will cast out demons. In my name, you will lay hands upon the sick. In my name, you will do these things. What God was telling Moses, no more excuses. I say to you this morning, I say this to myself, I say this to the church in Elsinore, I say it to you. I say it to the body of Christ. No more excuses. No more excuses. Why we can't exercise in faith and obedience. Why we can't exercise our lives in faith and obedience. Pastor Glenn, last week, was sharing during our prayer time, powerful word. And he said this, when we don't exercise our faith, we decay. Think about it. When we don't exercise our faith, we decay. We're in decay. He also said this, and I wrote it down, that your life is a seed to sow. Your life is a seed to sow. See, human nature would say, let's just play it safe for 2015. I don't bother the devil. He don't bother me. I don't get my neighbors upset about Jesus too much, and they don't get upset with me. You cannot be neutral in this war. You cannot be neutral in this calling. It's time to go on the offense and say this. No more excuses. No more excuses. And we've got to quit sitting on our seed. You can't sit on the seed that God has given you to sow your life into. Every one of you, your life is a seed. Jesus said if you hang on to it, you lose it. But if you give it away for the kingdom of God for his sake, guess what? You find it. Who wants to find their life in God this morning? Who wants to find their life in God? No more excuses. I'll say it again. Your life is a seed to, to sow. Amen. And when we're not exercising our faith, we're in decay. God never gave you a reverse That's gear. Right. Right. There's no reverse gear as a Christian. The cloud is moving. Yeah. Are you following the cloud? Yes. 
And when the night comes, there was still a witness of the fire by night. So whether it's sunny skies in your life or it's dark, there's always a witness, there's always guidance that I am God and I am there in the light and I'm there even in the darkest places. Are you hearing this? Christy, would you come? There's a question for 2015, and I heard this in a song, and then I realized later on it was by Casting Crown, a song called Thrive. came out in 2013. Some of you probably have heard it, don't know it. Maybe you know it. But I told my secretary, Heather, I said, Heather, I just have got this thing from hearing this song. My question for all of you in 2015, will you in 2015 thrive or just survive? Will you thrive or are you just going to try to survive? I want to thrive. Because there's so much of Jesus that he wants to uncover to you and me. Uncover his will for your life. Uncover the greatness of our God. Uncover how much he loves us. And uncover the authority and the power that he's invested in you. Would you stand with me, please? The word uncommon means this. It means out of the ordinary, unusual. The word uncommon means out of the ordinary, unusual. And I just want to speak some things over you. And if it's in your heart to just say yes to every one of these things, you would just begin to say yes as I begin to declare these things to you. As I begin to declare them, you want to put your hand up to the Lord and say yes, I say yes to this. 2015, God's going to give you uncommon faith. God is going to give you uncommon grace. God is going to give you uncommon opportunities. God is going to give you uncommon revelation. God is going to give you un, uncommon giving ability. Yes. Let me say this. We're paused. How many of you are praying about how much God wants you to give into missions this year? I'm challenging the people in Elsinore. I'm challenging them on three levels, and I don't want to limit these levels. I said 300, 500, or 1,000 in missions uncommon opportunities to give. Would you say yes? Uncommon receiving. Come on, it goes together. Uncommon joy. Uncommon intercession. Let me stop right there. Sharon, where are you? Where are, the, where are the ladies that pray with you? And I don't want to limit to just ladies, but who, who gathers with Sharon for intercession and prays for the church and a different thing? Just wave your hands. Come on. It doesn't have to be ladies, but I don't understand ladies, even men. This is for all of us. The birthing room. The birthing room. Sharon, the birthing room is coming alive. And there's birth pains for the kingdom. There's birth pains for this church. There's birth pains for Rim. But there's birth pains for the community. There's birth pains for different leaders. There's birth pains for the different Africa, these different things. There is birth pains. And you, as ladies and as a church, will begin to groan and moan it because of the intercession that would come upon your life. It's by the Spirit. Do you hear this? I can't emphasize this enough. There is an uncommon grace. There's an uncommon prayer and intercession in the birthing room of the purposes of God for the church and for the kingdom. Yeah. It will come because of intercession 
and allowing, allowing God to work through you in the area of intercession and prayer as never before. And the devil will fight you hand and foot to keep you from praying. Mm. Mm. Do you hear what I'm saying? This kind does not come out except by prayer and by fasting, Jesus said. Two times. We're back to the uncommon. Uncommon favor. Uncommon peace. And with this comes opposition and warfare. All of these things. And with this comes opposition and warfare. And all God wants us to say is yes. Yes. Come on. Yes. You know what? Jesus told the disciples when he began to lay it out in John 6, will you leave also? And Peter said, Lord, <laughs> hallelujah. Where else can we go? I want to encourage you on your journey of faith. I want to encourage you on your journey of dedication. I want to encourage you on your commitment to your local church and this family. All of these things are uncommon, unusual, that God wants to release to you who will believe and say, yes, Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Give Jesus a big hand. Hallelujah. Moses could have said no. The implication is he said yes. Sometimes just in our response is where the greatest struggle is. Because it's human nature to avoid pain. This past week we were watching something, I don't remember what it was, but this word of wisdom came. And it was in a time when someone was suffering. And they were in great pain. And this person spoke to them and said, pain is the tool that creates maturity. Wow. Tool to create maturity. And I just heard that and I just found myself not wanting to be immature. And I know with challenges that we have in our lives to say yes, there can be the perception of pain. Because if I say yes, what is it that I have to give up or let go of? I just think that that's wrong. Because we have so much in the world today encouraging us, do whatever you can to avoid pain. Well, and sometimes when we do that, when yes is on our lips by the Spirit of God to say, we find it easier to be silent or to say no. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Just say yes. I believe that God has so much for us. Just say yes. And let's see him do what he came to do in his church. I believe that that yes is one word that the devil hates when it's not mentioned in allegiance to him. When we say yes, the finishing touches of all that God has for us goes into motion. Because it says that he wants to change us from glory Amen. to glory. And I realize in order for that to take place, the unseen has to be uncovered. 
What is my resistance to saying yes? I want to get rid of that. I want to get rid of that. I realize that a transition has to take place in our lives. We go from, God, this is what I need, to God, what do you want? Amen. I change from me focused to God focused. Amen. I had a God focused atmosphere Amen. this morning. Amen. From the time we walked in yes. through the word to right now. And we're not going to stop. That's right. God, this isn't about what I need. This is about what you want. Even in our decisions. Well, I'd like to go there. I'd like to live there. I'd like to do that. I believe there's liberty to a certain degree in that. But even that ought to be, pro ought to be prefaced by God said. And I'm saying yes. Anything other than that, it becomes about me. And one thing that I know for sure, he shares his glory with no man. So I want to move, Lord, from what I need to what you want. And I say, yes, it is finished. Could we have the worship team back up here? I just want to sing this as we go on our way. It's a good sound to hear, to go out what we've heard today. It's finished. How is it finished? I said, yes. From there, it's up to God to do the rest. It's not up to me. I'm sure if Moses knew all that was in front of him other than what God had already spoken to him, it would have been easy for him to say, how about if I get back to you on that? But he had to make the decision. It's finished. It's finished. I said, yes, it's finished. I'm not going back. No reverse. I'm not going back. It is finished. So, Lord, I just pronounce a benediction over the people this morning. You can feel free to come forward, worship. May it be an act of devotion, but also an act of motion that, Lord, I'm not going back. I'm not stepping away. I'm stepping up. I'm not shrinking back. I'm moving forward because what I have today, I have the word. And if I have the word, I have life. And what it is today, it is finished. It is finished. You said it. I believe it. That settles it. And I'm making that dedication today. It's you. It's you. It's you.